Oh, I think the most important thing that's happened recently is the emergence of intelligent design creationism as the major strategy of anti-evolutionists. That and uh, the second major strategy, which is to avoid reference to creationism of any kind and just cut straight to the chase as far as they're concerned and just teach that evolution is terrible science, it's weak theory, it shouldn't be taken seriously by students with the intention that students will then reject evolution and then by default creationism wins. And that latter strategy is particular, particularly clever because it avoids or at least is intended to avoid some of the legal problems that the various forms of creationism have run into. Science is a way of understanding the natural world by testing explanations against the natural world. That's what makes it a very special and a very useful way of knowing. And it is really the best way of knowing that we've come up with, we human beings have come up with for understanding the natural world. The best way of, of understanding the natural world is to use the methods of science. The methods of science are not necessarily unique. They're actually the methods of any kind of critical thinking. You would probably use them in history or you might use them in some other areas where, where testing of ideas is very important. But to me, the thing that makes science really useful and, and a really, really good way of understanding the natural world is that we test our explanations against the natural world. And if our explanations don't hold up when we test them, then we abandon them. And we only provisionally keep them if they do match, the, match reality. Um, we tinker with them some more, we test them again, and we eventually come up with a pretty good way of understanding whatever that phenomenon was. Now, science is really an excellent way of, of understanding the natural world. You know, the terms that we use in science are used very specifically in science as terms of art, but they have very different meanings on the street. And this is a source of a lot of confusion. When scientists talk about fact, they're talking about confirmed observations. And facts are interesting, but they're not terribly exciting. They don't, they don't do a whole lot for you. Facts are a dime a dozen. There's facts all over the place. A hypothesis is a testable statement. You're saying, you know, what's the relationship between this and this? And you go out and test it, and you either accept or reject your, your uh, statement of that relationship. Hypotheses are very useful. They're very helpful. Uh, they, they help us build theory. Theories are the most important things in science. Theory to a scientist means explanation. And these are logical constructs of, of facts, of tested hypotheses, of laws, of all kinds of stuff that taken together and put in a logical descriptive fashion help us understand some kind of natural phenomenon. Most lay people think that theories are guesses or hunches or something that you don't have to take terribly seriously. It's not such a big deal completely opposite in science. Theories are the most important things in science. What a lot of, unfortunately, textbooks lead people to, to misunderstand is that a really good theory grows up into a law, as if uh, theories are, are refined and then become laws, and laws are somehow more important than theories. In science, actually, what a law is is a descriptive generalization. So we talk about the laws of thermodynamics that tell you about um, heat under different circumstances. You hear about the laws and study the laws of uh, heredity that Mendel developed, the law of independent assortment and so forth. Descriptive generalizations. What's going to happen under a given situation, uh, given, given certain constraints, and uh, this, will, this will regularly happen? But laws are broken, uh, both in science as well as, as uh, in the real world. Um, the law of independent assortment, M Mendel's very important idea that the hereditary units uh, behaved independently of one another. Well, actually, that's true, except when the units, which now we call genes, are located too close together on the chromosome then they don't act independently. They're, they're passed down as, as, as a pair. So laws can be broken, but laws are just descriptive generalizations. They're very useful, they're very helpful. They're not as important as theories, because theories explain laws. So in general, the, um, the, 
the hierarchy of explanation is very different in science than it is in the general public. The general public puts, puts facts on top, laws next, um, hypotheses and then theories. Maybe theories and hypotheses can move around a little bit. In science, on the other hand, theories are the most important thing. Laws are next most important. Uh, hypotheses are next most, most important. And perhaps the least most important part of a scientific explanation is facts, because facts are a dime a dozen. And facts don't explain anything. Evolution is a theory because it is one of these logical constructs of facts and laws and hypotheses and, and uh, understandings that allow you to make the inference that living things had common ancestors. Theories are always inferential. Uh, all the most important ideas in science are inferential. They're not observations. What you can observe in the fossil record is the um, presence of more and more complicated organisms through time. What you can observe through looking at biochemistry or comparative anatomy is that some organisms are more similar to each other than they are to other organisms and so forth. What you would, what we, what you would infer from all those different sources of information is that the best explanation for the anatomical similarities and differences and the biochemical similarities and differences and the location, or excuse me, and the, the kinds of fossils and where you find them in the geological record. The best explanation for all of that is an inference that living things had common ancestors. And it's not like a hypothesis. Hypotheses are, are very um, lo much lower on the scientific explanation totem pole, so to speak. A hypothesis is a testable statement. You either accept it or you corroborate it. Sorry, you either corroborate it or you reject it. Um, but, but theories are much more important and they're much more uh, um, useful to you. Um, the, Inference that living things have common ancestors explains a phenomenal amount of biology, including the similarities and differences in organisms and um, a great deal of their biochemistry and cell biology as well. Evolution in the broadest sense is a statement of history. It says that the universe has had a history, that if you were able to go back in time, what you would see in terms of stars or galaxies or the planet Earth or plants and animals on Earth would be different than what you see today. That some change through time has taken place. And evolution is a very, very broad concept that really is part of any science you can think of. Astronomy is an evolutionary science because stars and galaxies have uh, changed through time. Uh, geology is an evolutionary science because the planet Earth and the solar system uh, have changed through time. And biology is an evolutionary system, evolutionary science, because living things have changed through time. Specifically with biological evolution, we talk about living things having shared common ancestors. That's the big idea of biological evolution. And anthropology is a science as well because human cultures and human culture has changed through time as well. The theory of evolution is extremely well accepted in the scientific community. Astronomers, geologists, biologists, anthropologists all accept the idea that the universe has had a history and in biology that living things have common ancestors. It's not something that we argue about any more than physicists argue about whether uh, Einsteinian relativity is a, is a solidly based theory, any more than they would argue about Newtonian mechanics being a solidly based theory. So there really is not a great difference in the way that scientists look at evolution as a solid theory than any other solid theory. The controversy over evolution and creationism is 
primarily a North American phenomenon. And it has a couple of different sources, perhaps the most important of which is the religious history of the United States, which is quite different from that of Europe and Great Britain, where this is not a big issue. In the United States, we have a very conservative form of Protestant Christianity called fundamentalism and many offshoots of it. And a lot of Americans, uh, a lot of American Christians are more or less biblically literalist in their theology. This is a tradition that you really do not find uh, to be very popular at all in other Christian countries around the world. But the enthusiasm for biblical literalism within Christianity has a lot to do with why many people just simply do not accept evolution, because indeed, evolution is incompatible with that form of Christian theology. You cannot, you know, if you believe that God created everything all at one time in its present form about 10,000 years ago, you're going to have a problem with evolution. It's not going to be acceptable to you. Biblical literalism is one source of rejection of evolution for many American Christians. But there's another um, reason why many Americans reject evolution, and when they're theology is not literalist, when they, their theology doesn't require them to reject evolution, so to speak. And that is because evolution by natural selection uh, seems to place God a little bit more distant from human beings. I mean, if God created us separately, specially, then we have a certain close personal relationship to God, according to many Christian theists. If God just created the mechanisms of, of evolution and um, evolution brought forth human beings, then that puts God a step back and makes him a little less personal. And a lot of American Christians don't like the idea of evolution because it seems to, to mean that they might not have as close a relationship to God as they would like. So both biblical literalism as well as the, the fear of losing a personal God or a sufficiently personal God, uh, distresses many American Christians about evolution. I don't know that they have to understand the controversy. I think that Americans need to understand evolution in order to be scientifically literate. And there is a great deal of problem in getting evolution taught in the uh, kindergarten through 12th grade uh, level. And there's a problem with evolution being taught properly at the university level. There's an awful lot of university classes that should be teaching evolution that just sort of don't get around to it. And uh, so the people who become the teachers for the next generation of K-12 students also don't get evolution. Um, plus, in, the, in popular culture, there's a lot of confusion about evolution. Evolution is often distorted in terms of our movies or plays or, or literature or whatever. So in general, Americans don't have a very clear understanding of what evolution is at all. And if you don't really understand evolution, you're not going to be scientifically literate. And I think that's a problem because there are an awful lot of, of issues that um, Americans need to make decisions about today that involve science, and some even specifically involving evolution. And unless we have a scientifically literate population, we're not going to be making those decisions in the best way, or even electing the uh, representatives who will make those decisions for us. I think that the creationism and evolution issue is, is one that's of considerable interest to people. I think that there are many people who are puzzled about, uh, you know, from both sides, why people accept evolution when the evidence is so strong against it. Why do people reject evolution? The evidence, evidence is so strong for it. Um, I wrote a book about the controversy itself because I wanted people to, to understand uh, how strong evolution was, what the nature of science was, what the history of this controversy was, and what some of the positions of, of current creationists are, and of course the uh, opposite points of view as well, in areas uh, like science, but also outside of science, in, in law and education and religion. And I hope that um, people will not only find it an interesting uh, issue, I think many people do, but will also maybe understand uh, why we have this problem here in the United States, and maybe figure out better ways of dealing with it, because we really do need a population, a citizenry, that understands science better and understands evolution better, and realizes that uh, there is not a necessary conflict with 
most forms of faith. There are a variety of creationist claims. Um, the young earth creationists tend to make the um, largest number of fact claims. And the fact claims they make, of course, are efforts to try to get the history of the world or the t history of plants and animals to fit with a special creation view as presented in Genesis. And there's simply no evidence to support these views whatsoever. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of evidence against it. In those few cases where creationists actually do make claims of fact, like the whole planet was covered with water because of Noah's flood, um, they simply do not have any evidence to support it. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of evidence that refutes these claims. What the creationists tend to do is search through the scientific literature and pull out little anomalous observations or little anomalous uh, bits from scientific papers and say, see, we told you evolution didn't happen, therefore we're right, therefore special creation happened. And of course, evidence against evolution is not evidence for creationism. Uh, what they claim to be evidence isn't really evidence at all. What creationists usually bring in to try to demonstrate that evolution never happened are um, little anomalous uh, observations that they reinterpret to indicate that, for example, the Earth is young. Uh, if the Earth is young, well, of course, evolution loses right away because evolution does require a very long period of time to actually work. One of the classic creationist examples has to do with the amount of underwater oil seepage uh, that you find in these um, uh, geologic vents underneath the uh, surface of the ocean. And uh, there are trickles of water that come up and creationists will take an actual scientific article, say, that has measured the rate of, of flow from one of these undersea vents. And uh, they'll extrapolate from that, well, if the Earth is, is million, billions of years old, like you, like you evolutionists say it is, then the oceans would be completely oil. I mean, how can you prove this? And of course, uh, these kinds of rate arguments that they use are, are really preposterous. The fact that a vent uh, has a particular rate of oil flow does not indicate that that vent has always been flowing at that rate since time immemorial. I mean, it's just a very silly argu argument. But most of their arguments do have to do with trying to refute the idea that the Earth is billions of, old, of years old, because that, of course, would uh, do in evolution on the spot.